do appreciate you being here today. Now, last week we learned that the, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Now, Peter also listed seven qualities that we should add to the foundation of faith. If you missed any messages that we have here at Putnam, you can always watch them on our Facebook page or at putnamchurch.org. So don't forget that on the weeks that you might be out. Today's passage is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 21. It's on page 1894 of your pew Bible. Now this is the second letter of Peter writing to the churches of Asia. And he wants to make sure that when he's gone, that they're prepared to continue to stand. So let me read, starting with verse 12. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon be put it aside and that Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. You did not follow cleverly devised stories when I told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from that majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven and we were with him on that sacred mountain. We also have a prophetic message as something completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it. As a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as if they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you some questions as we get started today. How do we know that the Bible can be trusted? Why is it that God's Word is set apart from all other claims of divine revelation? And why does it stand as the standard, the standard source of truth, the Holy Scriptures? And why does it tell us that we must trust God's sacred Word as that sure standard, both for our actions and our beliefs? This is a vital topic in this letter. And it was written to believers so that they might remember the sound teaching that Peter proclaimed to them in these letters. To spur them on to their diligence of faith. To shore them up in their biblical foundations and their beliefs and their practices. In verses 12 through 18, Peter reminds us of what truth is and what truth is not. And then in verses 19 through 21, he gives a rare description of the process by which God communicated to the world his word through human authors, that is, in the Holy Scriptures, and why we can be sure of this source. So as we drill down first on verses 12 through 15, in light of the present benefits and future rewards, Peter encouraged his readers to diligently develop Christian virtues on this upward journey from the foundational faith that we looked at last week, building it up all the way through agape love. That was in chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Peter then says that he will continue to remind them of these things as long as he's in this earthly dwelling. That is, as long as he was physically alive. He's reminding them of this. He's not announcing some sort of new revelation or radical principles that they've never heard before. Peter clearly states that he, they already knew these things and they have been established in the truth. So important are these things that Peter makes sure to reinforce them one last time as he knows his time on earth is drawing to a close because he was given a special revelation from the Lord that his would soon suffer, martyred him for his faith. And this divine communication was not uncommon among those early apostles where they would have direct revelation from God announcing something that was coming up. And in this case, Peter's martyrdom was soon approaching. So fundamental truth, this Christian is something that God people are firmly established in. And that's why he came to remind us in verse 12 that truth isn't an answer to the cosmic guessing game to be solved by clever people. It's not vague. It's not uncertain. It's not indefinite. 
It doesn't change by the winds of culture or the whims of our experiences. The fact that Peter reminds them of this truth in which they were previously established underscores that it doesn't change. God's truth is truth from the beginning through all time. Peter also says that the truth is objective. God objectively, his true revelation can be expressed in clear, unambiguous language in verse, verse 15. It establishes believers' faith. It regards God's person and his will, and it reveals the reality of human life, the past, the present, and yes, our future reality. So having touched on what truth is in verses 12 through 15, Peter then describes what truth is not in verses 16 through 18. And drawing on his own experiences as God's chosen apostle, he answers some of the doubts that some of these believers might have been having as Christians and then reflecting on this dependable truth that he's proclaiming here. Because truth is not a myth. Peter's word says it's not cleverly devised stories. And this comes from the Greek word mythos. And it gives us our English word myth. Myths are speculations, they're fables, they're fictions that are dreamed up by people to illustrate life and then compare them to analogies of spiritual truth. Or simply, they're given to entertain people, drawing them into a moving story. Peter was surrounded by the ancient myths regarding the religions, the religions of the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, and the Egyptians. They concocted all sorts of stories regarding the exploits of their gods. Fictional movies and novels might be the equivalent today. Although Star Wars might entertain us, it might delight us, it might move us, it might excite us. Do we really believe that there is a galaxy far, far away where these characters actually exist? In some of the epic stories, such as J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings or C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia, they contain intentional parallels to the Christian truths, but nobody really believes that there is a Middle Earth or that there's a parallel universe that exists in the back of our closets. These are such fantastic stories, but they are easily discerned as mythological fiction. But Peter clarifies that the foundational Christian claims about the coming of Christ, his death, and his resurrection. And he says these do not fall into the genre of a myth. And how could Peter say this with such certainty? How can he be sure that these weren't just myths? That's because he was an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. He walked with him. He studied with him. He lived with him for over three years. He and the other disciples had seen the majesty of Christ with their own eyes, it says in verse 16. And Peter declares that he communicated the truth to his readers without any mixture of legend, myth, or fiction. Whereas false religions and false teachers in Peter's day rested in the beliefs and practices of fabricated stories, everything Peter taught concerning Christ came from an authentic personal experience that he had. Peter selects just one of these when he and James and John had witnessed that transfiguration on that sacred mountain. It was likely Mount Hermon, far north in the Galilee, as we're told in Matthew 17, Mark 9, and Luke 9. Peter chose this particular account as a primarily to be used about his personal reference because he heard God's voice speaking, God's testifying from that cloud, declaring in verse 17 that this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. Peter could legitimately say that God himself had validated the words and the works of Christ. He heard them with his own ears. Peter saw them with his own eyes. He saw Christ transform into a brilliance right before him in that transformation. So with Peter's ears and his eyes, he saw and he heard God's um, God confirm the truth that Jesus was who he was in his person and his work. And Peter points is that whereas the disciples previously had access to God's written word from Mount Sinai centuries earlier, he was now on Mount Hermon. And God spoke audibly. And he heard the voice. And he saw Jesus. And he saw the word made flesh. As John chapter 1.14 describes him. 
And then he saw Moses and Elijah. Matthew chapter 17, verse 3. These were Old Testament representatives of the law and the prophets. Peter understood that in Jesus, the Old Testament fi finds its words fulfilled. In Luke 24, verse 44, and John chapter 1, verse 45. With such stunning validation, Jesus' ministry, nobody could doubt that he had seen the truth personified. Of course, not all of us have the privilege of seeing the spirits of departed saints or hearing God himself confirming the truth of the Christian message. This was Peter's transition from a reliability of himself and the other apostles who had been eyewitnesses to this to the message of the reliability of the enduring word of God, the Holy Scriptures. We can go on to verses 20, 19 through 21. Peter begins his discussion of Scripture by saying that though the personal witnesses of Christ's glory and the voice of God have come from prophetic messages as something completely reliable in verse 19a, the prophetic word here refers to all Scripture, not just the books of prophecy. And Peter clarifies the definition in verse 20 by referring to the prophecies of Scripture. In Scripture, we have God's truth in a written form, available for us to read, to study, to ponder, to apply, to give us guidance through the power of the Holy Spirit. The truth never changes. It never goes out of date. The Old Testament saints relied on the Scriptures as an infallible witness of trustworthiness, and it was made more certain when Peter saw the prophecies that had been fulfilled regarding about the Messiah and that they actually came to pass in his lifetime. It was this sure foundation of truth that Peter directs his readers. And Peter says that they would do well to pay attention to them. And that could be said of us. We would do well to pay attention to God's word. His prophetic word in the Holy Scripture in verse 19b now, this word pay attention is a Greek word, prosheshko, and it means to focus our concern, our care, our commitment on something. This means cultivating more than merely a casual formality or familiarity with the Old Testament characters or some superficial understanding of the Old Testament stories. And uh, with us, it's also the New Testament stories. In very practical forms, it would mean that we should study God's word not merely read the text. It means that we should ponder it, not just peruse through it at our leisure. We should memorize scripture, not merely just mutter it occasionally. We're to apply it to our lives, rather than merely framing a few verses and hanging them on our walls. There's nothing wrong with that, as long as they are just a reminder to us that we need to dig deeper into God's word. In this way, we will handle the sure and authoritative word, written word of God as it was meant to be handled. Peter says, as a light shining in the dark places, verse 19. And here the dark places is ochmeros, and it literally means something that's murky. And Peter describes this word as a barren, filthy, dim lit, dimly lit place that may have had in mind a tomb or some sort of dungeon with little hope of escape. It reminded me of a murky water today as you have the world and it pollutes our minds with all of its filth. And our minds become murky and it's hard to see clearly through the murk that the world presents to us. And why we as believers live in this realm of a murky world where even our human wisdom and our understanding are untrustworthy guides we must rely on one source of sure guidance, and that's God's word to light our path. As the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my, guide my feet and a light for my path. It's easy for us to go astray, to find ourselves neck deep in that mire of the world, the murky swamp, that we don't follow that penetrating light of God's word. In keeping with the pattern, Peter injects a bright ray of hope amid the desperate situation. He reminds his readers that the day will come when God's glory of Christ will shine through, replacing the darkness of the world when he returns to reform, to transform the world into a global Eden. 
Jesus Christ, that morning star, the light of the world will return and will raise us up with him to share in his glory. As John chapter 8, verse 12 and Revelation 22, verse 16 tells us, until then we must adjust our eyes as the sure source of hope, the sure source of light in the dark world. It's the light of God's word that will help us to see all through all the murk of this world. If you look in your bulletin insert today on the side, it says, be sure of your source because God's word is the source. When Peter begins verse 20, he says, above all, he means pay attention, above all this, we should prick up and give the following statement our full attention. What he's about to say is of utmost importance. The truth he wants all of us to know is that no prophecy of Scripture came by the prophet's own interpretation of things. But what does Peter really mean with this? With the prophecy of Scripture? I've given us three points today to look at in our, our bulletin insert. Now some people might take this to mean the individual shouldn't try to interpret Scripture on their own. However, the word interpretation in this passage is only listed once in the entire um, Bible, and this Greek word is ellipsis, and it only occurs here in the Bible. Because the ordinary Greek word that they would be used for interpreting means a biblical text would be dianagio, as in Luke chapter 24, verse 32, or derimenio in Luke 24, verse 27. So what he's saying here isn't that it isn't a matter of the prophet's own interpretation, but it doesn't mean that individuals can't interpret Scripture. We must have a humble dependence. And I wrote it a little bit differently in the bulletin answer. It says individual believers can interpret Scripture, but only through the humble dependence on the Holy Spirit and the diligent study of the biblical text. Then what else does Peter mean when he says the prophet's own interpretation? Well, a second possibility is that Peter is declaring that no passage of Scripture can, is intended to stand on its own. Oh, we love to cherry-pick verses out and hang on to those. We love to prove our own doctrine by cherry-picking verses out to our own liking. But that's not what God intended His Scriptures to be. He says that no prophet speaks or writes a word contrary to what has already been revealed. And the implication of this idea is twofold. A passage of Scripture will never contradict another passage, even if it's written by a different author. And second, every individual passage must be understood in light of the whole Scripture and in light of the parallel or related passages. And I would like to add a third one here that I didn't put in the bulletin insert. A third one would be, we must as best as possible, and it's hard for us in this Western world, but to understand the Scripture in its original context, the original cultural setting, looking behind the eyes of those that were written to writing the scripture or those that were receiving it. We think of everything through 21st century America. It's very different than the cultural context when the setting of the scripture, when it was initially given. So if we can use those points, we're well on our way to understanding scripture. But the third view, which ties best to Peter's passage here, is that all prophecies of Scripture do not ultimately come from the prophet's personal interpretation or from merely human interpretation. It ultimately comes from God. The ultimate source of Scripture is God. Peter explains this process in verse 21, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, when we allow this verse to interpret what Peter means by the prophet's own interpretation, this third view makes the best sense in context of this scripture. Scripture is not a record of fallible human ideas and the interpretation of what God's revelation has. God actually, his actual inherent, in, inerrant and authoritative word was written through human authors. The Holy Spirit providentially kept them from error as they wrote, those original documents. But this third view, if it is correct, the second view of Scripture does not contradict itself, must also be considered as truth. Because only one divine author stands behind both the Old and New Testament, and that author is God. In verse 21, 
is one of the most significant verses of the Bible on the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture. That means without error. Peter clearly says that Scripture is not ultimately the result of human ideas or will. Yes, humans were involved in the process. But that the product, the Holy Scripture, has a character and quality that surpasses what mere humans could ever compose. Unlike those cleverly devised stories, the world's myths, the Word of God came from God's direct involvement. A vivid word picture describes here the human authors were moved by the Holy Spirit. That means they were carried along, as the New International Version says. And the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. And it also the word is also the word for wind. The same word, spirit and wind, is pneuma. The term moved is pharaoh. And it means to bear or to be carried along. And in this case, apart from one's own ability or power. This form of the word, verb here is a passive form. And Luke used the same passive pharaoh in the nautical sense when he wrote in Acts chapter 27, verse 15 and 17, referring to the ship that was driven along on their journey by the wind. Scripture was driven along when it was written by God's breath. It was God-breathed because the process of writing, the authors were under a unique control by the Spirit. But nevertheless, they were consciously involved in this process. Now, some would say that in the Scripture doesn't mean that God audibly dictated word for word. He did not do that. It doesn't mean that these human authors were in some sort of hypnotic trance and just wrote and didn't understand or see what they were even writing. Instead, in many cases, they were probably even unaware that the Holy Spirit was directing them or moving them to compose God's records, these inspired words without error. The result of this process is inspired in the errant text of Scripture. He used the writers of Scriptures in their context, in their mindset, in their setting to write these words, and they understood it based on their context of their day. But it was still God's inherent word. When the New Testament writers referred to Scriptures, it was primarily had in mind the Old Testament. The Jews and the early Christians accepted the Old Testament as God's inspired word. However, we'll see that Peter already knew that the writings that he was writing and some of the other apostles were writing were prophets of the same quality as the Old Testament and that they should be treated in the same kind of respect and obedience as we'll study in 1 Peter chapter 3, or 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, a little later. Now, how does Peter's te technical description of inspiration of Scripture fit into his all, overall purpose for writing this letter to these Christians in Asia Minor that were dispersed in this area, many suffering persecution. It was to spur them on to be diligent in their faith, to shore up their biblical foundation of their beliefs and their practices. In all these areas, the understanding of scriptural authority is essential. When the apostles departed this life, as Peter soon would, he wanted the scriptures to guide these churches so they would know how to live, how to act, how to worship together. Only by centering their faith in the word of God would they be able to discern the false doctrine and defeat the deceitful claims of the heretics. Paul puts the importance of scripture in this way. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, he says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It is to correct us when we are wrong and to teach us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. If you'll see the graphic there at the bottom of the side of the bulletin insert, insert the Word of God is an enduring confidence of the enduring prophetic Word. Which brings us to the application today of 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 21 through, 12 through 21. It's on the other side of your bulletin insert. The application is drinking from the purest source. Now Peter's message in this first century believers is just as relevant today. In fact, in our generation of growing skepticism, cynicism, antagonism, and atheism, we must heed the message as if Peter was writing directly to us, as if we were there and Peter was reciting his letter to us. Peter's words are meant to turn our minds 
with two vital truths, and I've listed these two truths in our bulletin insert today. The first truth is to remember that when you turn to God's Word, you're consulting the most reliable of all sources. The world, world is filled with conflicting claims of truth, alternate sources of revelation, competing philosophies, or some might say fake news. We could drown in an ocean of worldly delusions and devilish distractions in our media-saturated world. In this dangerous deluge, the Bible provides a source of life-giving air. Scripture alone contains God's Word written. It's a written objective and unchanging standard of truth. Just as a scuba diver wouldn't last more than a few moments without a steady supply of air, Christians can't thrive spiritually without a constant breathing of God's spiritual word of truth. If you're not into God's word, you'll soon suffocate with the world and its truths. How many of us, though, sip God's word like it's a cup of some sort of bad medicine? We might take a spoonful during our Sunday morning sermons or taste a few drops when we see some sort of sweetened, inspired devotion. But if we take God, or Peter's words of Scripture seriously, we don't sip God's Word, we guzzle it. His life-giving truth, letting that cool, clean waters quench our famished souls and satisfy our longing hearts and cleanse our polluted minds. The second truth today is remember that you'll fall into error when you make any other sources your truth. Those could be experiences, dreams, feelings, supernatural phenomenon, or opinions, and we make them equal or more reliable than the Scriptures. They cannot be. Peter knows all too well his entire letter is filled with warnings against those who did just that. They placed a different source of knowledge above God's Word, and the results are always disastrous. Today, we must counter the culture the culture of lies, the world of deceptions that threatens to undo our convictions and to unravel the truth of God's Word and unravel our faith. When we aren't drinking from the pure source of God's Word, our opinions, our ideas, our principles that come from the world become our source of truth. Just think of the thousands of truth claims that we're bombarded with from the moment we wake up in the morning to when we put our head on the pillow at night. No matter how keen our discernment may be, many false or distorted claims impact our perception of reality. And I know I've used an analogy of a Brita filter before, and I've not tried this experiment at home, so we'll see how it works. I only had one Brita filter left. We'll see if it stands up to its claims, and think of God's Word as the Brita filter that filters out all the pollution of the world and leaves us with pure, clean water in our minds. The word of pure water, it looks like it's sort of clogged. But the little bit that's there, believe me, it's clean. <laughs> Slowly dripping through. And that's what God's word does. When we take in the filth of the world, it cleanses that filth out so that our mind is filled with that which is pure. And if we don't allow that filter of God's Word to cleanse what we take in every day in our sights and our sounds and our perceptions of what we read, what we see, then we'll be filled with the pollution of the world. And this is what our thinking will be. This will be what we think is truth instead of the clean, pure water of God's Word. As the graphic says there, in the middle of the page, we must be grounded in the truth. In the last paragraph there on the bulletin insert, ask yourself, are you among those who just sip God's word as the most reliable source of truth? Or do you draw us on scripture deeply and constantly to counter the claims of a world careening into doctrinal and moral chaos? So before we go on this week, let's examine our own practices of what we do for as far as reading, studying, and meditating on God's word. Is it consistent with the high priority that Peter places on his word to allow us to live lives that are holy and true before God? Are you drinking 
from the purest source of truth, and that purest source of truth is God's Word. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for your love, your goodness, your mercy to us. We pray that each day we will set aside time, make it a priority to study your Word, Father, to read your Word, to allow your Word to filter out the pollution of this world so that our minds are filled with your Word, that we might live a life that's pleasing to you, Father, that others might see our lives and say, I want what that person has. I want to become part of God's kingdom. May our lives proclaim that. Even if we don't get a chance to speak words at times, may our lives proclaim by how we live that we are part of God's kingdom and that the world should desire that same thing that we have in our hearts, Father. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And for next week, I'd encourage you to read 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1-3. through 3.